A few weeks ago, I, w I was in my studio in Paris, and the phone rang, and I heard, hey, JR, you won the TED Prize 2011. You have to make a wish to save the world. I was lost. I mean, I can't save the world. Nobody can. What is fucked up? Come on. You have dictators, uh, you know, ruling the world. Population is growing by million. Uh, there's no more fish in the sea. The North Pole is melting. And as the last TED Prize winner said, we're all becoming fat. <laughs> Except maybe French people. <laughs> so, whatever. So I called back and I told her, look, Amy, I tell the TED guys I just won't show up. You know, I can't do anything to save the world. She said, hey, JR, your wish is not to save the world, but to change the world. Oh, all right. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, technology, politics, business do change the world. Not always in a good way, but they do. <laughs> what about art? Could art change the world? I started when I was 15 years old, and at that time, I was not thinking about changing the world. I was doing graffiti, writing my names everywhere, using the city as a canvas. I was going in the tunnels of Paris, on the rooftops, with my friends. Each trip was an excursion, was an adventure. It was like leaving our mark on society to say, I was here, you know, on the top of a building. So when I found a cheap camera in the subway, I started documenting those adventures with my friends and give them back into photocopies, really small photos, just that size. That's how, at 17 years old, I started pasting them. And I did my first expo de rue, which means sidewalk gallery. And I framed it with colors so you would not confuse it with advertising. I mean, the city is the best gallery I could imagine. I would never have to make a book and then present it to a gallery and let them decide if my work was you know, nice enough to show it to people. I would confront it directly with the public in the streets. So that's Paris. I would change, you know, depending on the places where I would go, the title of the, of the exhibition. That's on the Champs Elysees. I was quite proud of that one, <laughs> because I was just aiding, I was just up there on the top of the Champs Elysees. And when the photo left, you know, the frame was still there. <laughs> November 2005. The streets are burning, a large wave of riots had broken in the toughest projects of Paris. Everyone was glued to the TV, watching disturbing, frightening images taken from the edge of the neighborhood. I mean, these kids, without control, showing Molotov cocktail, attacking the cops and the firemen, looting everything they could in the shops. These were criminals, thugs, dangerous, destroying their own environment. And then I saw it. Could it be possible? My photo on a wall revealed by a burning car, a pasting I've done a year earlier, an illegal one, still there. I mean, these were the faces of my friend. I know those guys. All of them are not angels, but they're not monsters either. So it was kind of weird to see those images and those eyes stared back at me through the television. So I went back there with a 28 millimeter lens. It was the only one I had at that time, but with that lens, you have to be as close as 10 inch from the person. So you can do it only with their trust. So I took full portraits of people from Lebowski. They were making scary faces to play the caricature of themselves. And then I pasted huge poster everywhere in the bourgeois area of Paris with their name, age, even building number of these guys.
A year later, the exhibition was displayed in front of the City Hall of Paris. And you go from a Turk images who've been stolen and distorted by the media, who's now proudly taking over his own image. That's where I realized the power of paper and glue. So could art change the world? A year later, I was listening to all the noise about the Middle East conflict. I mean, at that time, trust me, they were only referring to the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. So with my friend Marco, we decided to go there and see who are the real Palestinian and who are the real Israelis. Are they so different? When we got there, we just went in the street, started talking with people everywhere, and we realized that things were a bit different from the rhetoric we heard in the media. So we decided to take portraits of Palestinians and Israelis doing the same jobs. Taxi driver, lawyer, cooks. I asked them to make a face as a sign of commitment. Not a smile that really doesn't tell about who you are and what you feel. They all accepted to be pasted next to their other. I decided to paste in eight Israeli and Palestinian cities. And on both sides of the wall, we launched the biggest illegal art exhibition ever. We call the project Face to Face. The experts say, no way. <laughs> the, the people will not accept. The army will shoot you. The Hamas will kidnap you. We say, OK, let's, let's try and push as far as we can. I love the way that people will ask me, how big will be my photo? Oh, it will be as big as your house. When we did the wall, we did the Palestinian side. So we arrived with just a ladder, and we realized that they were not high enough, you know? And so a Palestinian say, uh, a guy said, OK, calm down, no way. I'm, I'm going to find you a solution. So he went to the Church of Nativity and bring back a, an old ladder that was so old that he could have seen Jesus being born. <laughs> we did face to face with only six friends, mm, two ladders, two brush, a rented car, a camera, and 20,000 square feet of paper. We had all sorts of help from all walks of life. <laughs> OK, for example, that's Palestine. We're in Ramallah right now. We're pasting portraits, so both portraits, in the streets in a crowded market. People come around us and start asking, what are you doing here? Oh, we, we're actually doing an art project, and uh, we're pacing a, a, an Israeli and a Palestinian doing the same job. And those ones are actually two taxi drivers. And then there was always a silence. You mean you, you're pacing an Israeli face, do, doing a face right here? Well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's part of the project. <laughs> and then I, I would always leave that moment, and we would ask them, so can you tell me who is who? And most of them <laughs> couldn't say. We even pasted on Israeli military tower, and you know, nothing happened. You know, when you paste an image, it's just paper and glue. I mean, people can tear it, tag on it, or even pee on it. Even some are a bit high up for that, I agree, but the people in the street, they are the curator, you know? The rain and the wind will take them off anyway. They are not meant to stay, but exactly four years now after, the photos, are, most of them are still there face-to-face -face demonstrated that what we thought impossible was possible. And you know what? Even easy. We didn't push the limit. We just showed that they were further than anyone thought. In the Middle East, I experienced my work in places with not much museum. So the reaction in the street were, you know, kind of interesting. So I decided to go further in this direction and go in places where there is zero museums. You know, when you go around in these developing societies, women are the pillars of their community. But the men are still the ones holding the streets. So we're inspired to create a project where men will pay tribute to women by posting their photos. I call that project Women Are Heroes. When I listened to all the stories everywhere I went on the continent, I couldn't always understand the complicated circumstances of their conflict. I just observed. Sometimes there was no words, no sentence, just tears. 
I just took their pictures and pasted them. Women are heroes took me around the world. Most of the places I went to, I decided to go there because I've heard about it through the media. So, for example, in June 2008, I was watching TV in Paris, and then I heard about this terrible thing that happened in Rio de Janeiro, in the first favela of Brazil named Providencia. Three kids, that was three students, were controlled by the army because they were not carrying their papers, and the army took them. And instead of bringing them to the police station, they bring them to an enemy favela, where they got chopped into pieces. I was shocked. All Brazil was shocked. I heard that it was one of the most violent favelas because the largest drug cartel controls it. So I decided to go there. When I arrived, I mean, I didn't have any contact with any NGO. There's no, there's, there was none in place, no association, no NGOs, nothing. No eyes witness. So we just walked around, and we met a woman. And I show her my book, and she said, you know what, we're hungry of culture. We need culture up there. So I went up, and I started with the kids. I just took a few photos of the kids, and the next day I came with the posters, and we pasted them. The day after I came back, they were already scratched. But that's OK. I wanted them to feel that the art belongs to them. Then the next day, I held a meeting on the main square, and some women came. They were all linked to the three kids that got killed. There was the mother, the grandmother, the best friend. They all wanted to shout the story. After that day, everyone in the favela gave me the green light. I took more photos, and we started the project. The drug, lo the drug lords were kind of worried about us filming in the place, so I told them, that, you know what, I'm not interested in filming the violence and the weapons. See that enough in the media. What I want to show is the incredible life and energy I've been you know, seeing around me the last few days. So that's a really symbolic pasting, because that's the first one we did, that you couldn't see from the city. And that's where the three kids got arrested, and that's the grandmother of one of them. And on that stairs, that's where the traffic on the road stand, and there's a lot of exchange of fire. Everyone there understood the project. And then we pasted everywhere, the whole hill. Thank you. What was interesting is that the media couldn't get in. I mean, you should see that. They would have to film us from a really long distance, you know, by a helicopter, and then have a really long lens, and we would see ourselves on TV pasting. And they would put a number, please call this number if you know what's going on in Providencia. <laughs> we just did a project and then left. So the media were there, oh, so how can we know about the project? So they had to go and find the woman, you know, and get an explanation from them. So you create a bridge between the media and the anonymous woman. We kept traveling. We went to Africa, Sudan, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Kenya. In war-torn places like Moravia, people come straight to you. I mean, they want to know what you're up to. They keep asking you, what is the purpose of your project? Are you an NGO? Are you the media? Art? Just doing art? Some people question, why is it in black and white? Don't you have color in France? <laughs> or, you know, or they tell you, like, are these people all dead? Some who understood the project will explain it to others. And to a man who didn't understand, I heard someone say, you know, you've been here for a few hours trying to understand, discussing with your fellows. During that time, you haven't think about what you're going to eat tomorrow. This is art. I mean, it, it's, I think it's people's curiosity that motivates them to come into the project, you know? And then it becomes more. It becomes a desire, a need, an amount. On this bridge, that's in Moravia, ex-rebel soldier helped us pasting a portrait of a woman that they might have been raped during the war. Women are always the first one targeted during conflict. This is Kibera, Kenya, one of the largest slums of Africa. You might have seen images about the post-election violence that happened there in 2008. This time, we covered the roof of the houses, but we didn't use paper. I mean, because 
Paper doesn't prevent the rain from linking inside the house. Vinyl does. Then art becomes useful. <laughs> so the people kept it. You know what I love is that, for example, when you see the biggest eye there, there's so much houses inside. And I went there a few months ago, photos are still there, and I, there was missing a piece of an eye. So I asked the people, what happened? Oh, the guy just moved. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's their own. When the move were covered, a woman said as a joke, now God can see me. You know, when you look at Kibera now, they look back. Okay, India. Uh, before I start there, just so you know, each time we go in a place, we don't have authorization, so we set up like commandos. You know, we're a group of friends. We arrive there and we try to paste on the walls. But there's places where you, you, know, you just can't place on the wall. In India, it was just impossible to paste. Like I heard culturally and, and because of the law, they, wouldn't, they would just arrest us at the first pasting. So we decided to paste it white, white on the wall. So imagine white guys pasting white papers. <laughs> so people would come to us and ask us, hey, what are you up to? Oh, you know, we're just doing art, art. Of course, they were confused, I mean. <laughs> but you know how India have a lot of dust in the street? And the more dust you would have going up in the air, on the, on the, on the white paper, you can almost see it, but there's a sticky part, you know, like when you reverse a sticker. <laughs> so the more dust you have, the more it will reveal the photo. So we could just walk in the street during the next days, and the photo would get revealed by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we didn't get caught this time. <laughs> Each project, that's a film from Women Are Heroes. Okay. For each, uh, um, each project, we do a film. And most of what you see here, that's a trailer from Women Are Heroes. It's images, photography, taken one after the others. And the photo kept traveling even without us. Hopefully you'll see the film and you understand the, the scape of, of the project and what the people felt when they saw those photos. Because that, that's a big part of it. There's layers behind each photo, behind each image. There's the story. Women Are Heroes created a new dynamic in each of the communities. And the women kept that dynamic after we left. For example, we did books, not for sale, that all the community would get. But to get it, they would have to make it signed by one of the women. We did that in most of the places. We go back regularly. And so in, in, in Providencia, for example, in the favela, we have a cultural center running there. In Kibera, each year we cover more roofs, because of course when we left, the people say, you know, that was just at the edge of the project, say, hey, what about my roof? <laughs> uh, so we decided to come the, the year after and, and, and keep doing the project. Really important point for me is that I don't use any brand or corporate sponsors. So I have no responsibility to anyone but myself and the subject. And that is for me like one of the most important things in the work. Uh, you know, I think today, as much as important as the result is the way you do things. And that have always been a certain part of the world. And what's interesting is that, that, that fine line that I have with images and advertising. We just did some pasting in Los Angeles in the, on a, another project in the last weeks. And um, I even was invited to cover the MoCA Museum. 
But yesterday, the city called them and said, look, we're going to have to tear it down, because this can be taken for advertising, and because of the law, it has to be taken, out, taken down. But tell me, advertising for what? <laughs> the people I photographed were proud to participate to the project and to have their photo in their community, but they asked me for a promise, basically. They asked me, please, make our story travel with you. So I did. That's Paris. That's Rio. In each place, we build exhibitions with the story and the story travel, and you understand the, the full scape of the project. That's London, New York. And today, they are with you in Long Beach. All right, recently, I started a public art project where I don't use my artwork anymore. I used Man Ray, Ellen Levitt, Giacomelli, other people's artwork. It doesn't matter today if it's your photo or not. The importance is what you do with the images, the statement it makes where it's pasted. So, for example, I pasted the photo of the minaret in Switzerland <laughs> a few weeks after they voted a law forbidding minarets in the country. <laughs> this image of three men wearing gas masks were taken in uh, uh, Chernobyl originally, and I pasted it in southern Italia, where the mafia sometimes buried the garbage under the ground. In some way, art can change the world. I mean, art is not supposed to change the world, to change practical things, but to change the perceptions. Art can change the way we see the world. Art can create an energy. Actually, the fact that art cannot change things makes it a neutral place for exchanges and discussions, and then enables it to change the world. When I do my work, I have two kinds of reactions. People say, oh, why don't you go in Iraq or Afghanistan? They would be really useful. Or how can we help? I presume that you belong to the second category. And that's good, because for that project, I'm going to ask you to take the photos and to paste them. So now my wish is <laughs> I wish for you to stand up for what you care about by participating in a global art project. And together, we turn the world inside out. And this starts right now. Yes, everyone in the room, everyone watching. I wanted that wish to actually start now. So a subject you're passionate about, a person you want to tell the story, or even your own photo, tell me what you stand for. Take the photo, the portraits, upload it. I'll give you all the details, and I'll send you back your poster, joined by groups and reveal things to the world. There's full details on the website, insideartproject.net, that is launching today. What we see changes who we are. When we act together, the whole thing is much more than the sum of the parts. So I hope that together we'll create something that the world will remember. And this starts right now and depends on you. Thank you. Thank you.